And then we also have we have the shared notes document that my colleague uh, Lauren has shared in, in the chat. So kindly feel free to sign in there with your name, your organization. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, put them in the Zoom chat or via the shared notes document, and then we'll go through them after the presentations. Uh, next slide, please. So just uh, some ground rules and expectations as, as we start this call. Uh, this, is, uh, this call is designed as a place for learning and conversation. We would like uh, us as a, as, a, as a community to be curious, to ask for clarifications, to ask deep questions that uh, challenge our thinking. Uh, we'd also like you to hold space for others, be curious about different perspectives, hold space for them to ask questions and also to contribute. And then also we finally would like to be respectful because we want to build community and not to tear it down. So there's a link to the IOI code of conduct uh, on, on the screen right now in case if you have any uh, comments or queries, kindly feel free to address those via the, the code of conduct. And uh, I also would want to share once again that there's uh, the link to the shared notes document uh, that has just been shared once again in the chat. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yes, uh, I now would want to now invite uh, my colleague, Amy Tsang, who's the engagement uh, engagement uh, manager for Invest in Open Infrastructure, the engagement lead, to kind of give us an overview of Invest in Open Infrastructure and uh, give us a bit more of the granular details about how we thought about the fund, how we designed it, how we operationalized it. So thank you very much. And let me welcome uh, Amy to this uh, conversation. Thank you so much, Jerry, and um, happy Friday, everyone. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here on Friday uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on who you, where you are. Uh, my name is Amy Tang. I'm the engagement lead at Invest in Open Infrastructure. Um, as Jerry was saying, I'm hoping to spend uh, maybe two minutes talking a little bit more about open, invested open infrastructure and what we do as an organization, and then move on to talking about um, some of the, the, the process with which we've built the open infrastructure fund and what we've learned on that journey as well. Um, and hopefully this will be uh, an a intriguing, um, thought-provoking conversation, and we also look forward to hearing from the eight wonderful grantees um, that uh, I think most of them will be represented and presenting their work as well in this call. So uh, Invest in Open Infrastructure is a nonprofit uh, initiative. Our mission is to increase the investment in any adoption of open infrastructure to further equitable access and participation to research. We do this in uh, three main ways. This is our uh, a slide outlining our core program for this year. Um, so. One, one of our core programs and ways that we're uh, effecting this change is by catalyzing investment. Um, so really looking at how we can increase the amount of funding and the diversity and mechanism of investment into open infrastructure to ensure that we're building towards a healthy, resilient and sustainable future for research and scholarship. And in particular, I'm highlighting this, this particular uh, core program here because that's uh, the Open Infrastructure Fund sits exactly within, within this core program, along with um, the IOI Fund for Network Adoption, which I'll, I'll go through in the end uh, with a little bit more detail as well. Um, we also have, alongside uh, Catalyzing Investment, two other core programs, one called Strategic Support, where we're working in a tailored manner, a partnership with infrastructures to uh, strengthen their uh, governance and sustainability. An example of that is our part current partnership with Archive um, and also with uh, funders and institutions to look at you know, how we can um, help them make more evidence-based informed decisions towards adoption of open infrastructure. Then last but not least, our core program called Data Room. Uh, in there, we are uh, designing and developing with the community actionable and accessible tools, research and guidance. Um, to, again, help everyone uh, make more informed decisions about how they can adopt and invest in, in open infrastructure. So uh, coming back to the Open Infrastructure Fund, um, the aim of the fund is really to strengthen the sustainability and resilience and increase the adoption of open infrastructure in line with our mission. Um, 
So in designing this fund, uh, we, we really had a few sort of hypotheses and goals that we wanted to explore more as we look at how, you know, we can uh, use the fund as a mechanism to, to test out ways to do, achieve the following goals. First is uh, in, to increase participation in funding decision-making, in particular thinking about, you know, the, the people who are often making these funding decisions and who are not often in those rooms, um, paying special attention to designing mechanisms where we can shift more of that power to especially the communities uh, who, which are most impacted by these funding decisions or are underrepresented in those decision-making rooms. Um, the second goal uh, for in designing the Open Infrastructure Fund is to increase access to funding for underrepresented communities. Uh, and so that, you know, we, we uh, with our sort of experience, years of experience in engaging and, and researching the open infrastructure space, we've, you know, come to recognize and, and really see certain dynamics in the sense that um, there are parts of the world where most of the resources and funding is concentrated. And so in, in designing this fund, we are intentionally looking at building processes and again, mechanisms that could potentially solicit and, and um, process more funding applications from low and middle income economies. And you'll see that reflected as well in the way that we have developed and designed the fund eventually. Um, and last but not least, uh, we think it's important to think about transparency of funding, funding mechanisms. Um, to shed more light on how the money is used and how decisions around money is being made in the open infrastructure space. So uh, the the fund, I would say from, from inception to this point, uh, it's, it's almost been a year and a half. Uh, it started at a, sort of officially at our funder summit in 2022 in October and November, where we ran a uh, participatory budgeting exercise with the participants, uh, precisely 36 of them, to identify uh, key areas of investment and also amounts into each of those areas. So we actually have a blog post on our website where we detail a lot more about you know, how we ran that mechanism on the platform called CoBudget, where basically all the participants are have a certain allocation or amount of money that they can um, allocate to six different areas of opportunity, depending on where they see, uh, which area they see needs the most investment in. And so it's, it's, it's a way for us to test out um, how, you know, we can collectively make decisions around uh, areas of investment and also to um, highlight acute, get, get, get strong signals for a few areas that really uh, the community sees as being uh, key areas to increase investment in. And then following the, the sort of outcome from the Funder Summit's exercise, we then um, went on uh, a global tour, if you will, where we uh, very intentionally try to design and be at places where we can interact with um, communities in, in uh, low and middle income economies to listen and, and learn from them, uh, to gather additional input on how we can, again, make the funding more accessible to their communities, where are their areas of need in particular, and to learn from those conversations and, and really incorporate them in thinking about how we design the Open Infrastructure Fund. So that is January to April last year. Um, we were in, in particularly in Accra in Ghana and also in Buenos Aires in Argentina to, to do this work. Following that, we launched a public uh, funding design survey. Uh, the survey was one, ran bilingually and we, we again designed it to ask uh, questions around a few key elements within the funding design, things like, should there be um, an amount reserved for low and middle income economies? How big should the grants be? Should it be, you know, micro grants under $5,000 or should it be big grants that are more than $50,000, for example? Questions like this to help us shape the call in a, in a participatory manner. Uh, and I think two weeks after we, we closed the survey, we uh, have finalized the details of the funding call based on the results from the survey and from our previous conversations. Um, and that that is something that I think a lot of you might have seen um, was published bilingually with the details of how one can apply and, and the process of, of application and evaluation 
And during that time between May and July, we also ran a couple of office hours where um, we we took a bit more time to to explain to the community how they can apply and the details of that as well. Um, I'm happy to share that you, and I think most of you would know as well that we've received received uh, close to 200 applications, um, and that is something that I would say was a surprise for for the team in a very good way. Uh, I think uh, very ca candidly, we expected around 70 applications, and and to receive 200 is 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 uh, it overwhelming in a very good way at that moment, and so uh, we quickly. Quite, quite quickly uh, recruited additional members to our community advisory panel who then really took on the uh, a, a strong role and uh, our key contributors to our public reviewing process that all happened on open review, which was our uh, open uh, submission and reviewing platform that we use for the open infrastructure fund. Um, so I, a huge thanks here and my gratitude to the panel for being very, very responsive and very, very helpful at that point to help us have in most cases, three reviews to every single application, um, scoring uh, and further discussions as well in September around, you know, how do we pick the the best applications, if you will, out of out of the group of close to 200. Um, so the decisions uh, resulted in sort of a short list of applications, which then we uh, uh, passed on to the IOI steering committee for further approval and that followed with a, a period of uh, due diligence and paperwork all the way to December last year. So uh, here I'd like to, the next few slides, I'd like to share a little bit as to, you know, whether we have achieved our goals and what we've learned on the way. Um, you remember that one of the goals of uh, the design of the Open Infrastructure Fund is to broaden participation in funding design and decision-making and Again, I think the numbers here speaks speaks for themselves in the sense that we've engaged over 100 people in the design of the funding of the fund. Um, with the public survey, we also asked the the part, the respondents whether or not they have been in the past involved in the design of the funding program, um, and and 47% of them has has not. This is the first time for them. While they have been working within the communities to help improve a certain condition or fix a problem. Um, we also, sorry, that is not a percentage. The percentage sign shouldn't be there, but we did have 55 community advisory panelists join us, um, of which 23 are based in low and middle income economies. And then we have, uh, they have together completed 579 publicly accessible reviews on openreview.net. In terms of increasing the accessibility of funding to underrepresented communities, again, uh, I think we, to a certain extent, is, is successful here in the sense that, you know, we have received um, 197 applications from 51 different countries, 31 of which is uh, in uh, low and middle income economies. Um, and I think uh, a large part of this could be attributed to the fact that, A, we've had, you know, very specifically a, a sort of carve out for projects that are serving or, or project teams that are based in low and middle income economies as well as the bilingual English, Spanish uh, call for applications and all the sort of supporting materials that had been done as much as possible bilingually, um, knowing that this uh, the language is often a barrier for, for especially uh, communities in Latin America, for example. Uh, and last but not least, uh, in terms of increasing transparency to how decisions are made, uh, I think uh, here I, I have chosen uh, some feedback from applicants that we've received uh, specifically when we uh, announced the decisions of the fund. Um, one applicant remarked that, you know, they have really the open decision and the open reviews have really helped them understand the decision and they've appreciated that openness in the process. And then the other you can see here is that they've also valued the transparency in the peer review process, although they did make a suggestion around whether or not um, making the reviews open after the decision is 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 a way is an alternative way to go forward, and so um, we're still learning, as I said. And uh, I'd also love to hear uh, your feedback as well if you you have additional thoughts as you as you've witnessed you know our open reviewing process and evaluation process. Um, in terms of you know where are we taking this work at this point? Of course, we're really excited to be 
hearing from these grantees and be learning from their work over the next, uh, I would say, couple of months to two years. Um, and we'd be we'd be very excited to continue to share the impact of their work with you on our website and, and blog as well as as we hear as we learn about their work. Um, but also more specifically, we have uh, at the Funders Summit also in 2022 announced our intention to launch a new fund, uh, which is now called the IOI Fund for Network Adoption. Uh, we're designing it to be a six to eight million US dollar fund to provide flexible catalytic investment to support research communities to adopt open infrastructure at scale. Uh, we, a lot of the learnings and, and sort of design mechanisms and le learnings with it that we've learned through building the Open Infrastructure Fund has is already influencing the way that we are thinking about the design of the IOI Fund. And so um, right now, if you are a network, so if you are with a library consortia, uh, with a national research and education network, other university associations, et cetera, where you have a, uh, the network has a sort of service relationship with the member institutions. Um, we'd love to know, we'd love to talk to you uh, and learn from you in this process. So please feel free to scan the QR code that you see on the screen and that will lead you to a form that you can fill in and Jerry will be in touch in, in a couple of weeks, I think. All right, thank you so much for, for this time. And uh, I hand back over to Jerry. Oh, actually, before I um, I stop, I just, on the logistical note, I would say that, uh, I will repeat what Lauren just posted in the chat, which is that, uh, noting that there will be in the next presentation, some of them will be in Spanish, some will be in English. So um, to select the language that you'd like to listen to these presentations in, please use the interpretation button in the Zoom bottom menu, and that should allow you to choose either English or Spanish and follow those presentations accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, I think right now we can uh, move uh, the meat and bones of this conversation, and we would like to hear from the eight wonderful questions that we have. Uh, and I'd want to invite uh, Frank from OSH to kind of give us an overview of the work that they are doing. I'd like to also add the, the grantees to also try to keep the presentations to five minutes because we have a lot of ground to cover in the time remaining. Thank you. Frank, uh, are you available? Hi, Jerry. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear you. Okay. If you have yeah. slides, also you have the ability to share. I do not have slides. All right. Um, so I, I will start. Uh, should I turn my camera uh, on or off? Yes, please. If you can turn your camera around, that would be great. OK. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Bentum. I am the executive manager for Africa Open Science and Hardware, Africa OSH. And we are grateful to be one of the eight awardees of the Open Infrastructure Fund Grant uh, for our project titled Education and Capacity Building for Open Science Hardware in Sub-Saharan African Universities, which we realize is a mouthful, so we shorten it to uh, ECB for OSH. So in our collective efforts to promote open science and hardware within the African scientific community, we realized it's important to employ strategies to foster education and awareness of open science and hardware principles, and also to develop the capacities and skills uh, to build and use open scientific instruments. So a little background on our project. In June, 2023, Africa OSH received a micro grant from uh, the GOSH community and the Albert P. Sloan Foundation for an open science hardware workshop. Uh, this workshop catered for uh, students of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology uh, in Kumasi here in Ghana. The workshop uh, focused on uh, educating the students on open science and hardware principles and also training them on how to build and use uh, an open flexure microscope. The workshop received remarkable, remarkably positive uh, feedback and reviews from the participants, but it also un un uh, unveiled a rather disturbing reality of the state of open science and hardware among uh, Ghanaian students. 
uh, so uh, motivated by the need for increased awareness and education in uh, open science and hardware, I developed the project proposal for ECB for OSH. Now, this project aims not only to foster awareness and education uh, of open science and hardware principles, but to also uh, train uh, students to build and use um, open scientific instruments, such as the open reflection microscope. We chose the open reflection microscope as the focal scientific tool for our projects due to its uh, its qualities, a low cost, uh, customizable, easily maintainable uh, scientific tool, uh, which in comparison to conventional microscopes um, stands out for its affordability and uh, accessibility, especially for uh, educational institutions and uh, individuals who are financially constrained or living in the lower middle income regions. Um, so the ECB for OSH project, the OSH, the, the project that we just won a grant for, who organize, um, is a, is a five month project starting from January, 2024 to uh, May, 2024. We'll organize um, six open science hardware workshops in three selected uh, Ghanaian universities. And uh, the project will train who educate and train over uh, 60 uh, Ghanaian university students uh, on how to build and use the open flexure microscope, uh, developing 12 uh, microscopes uh, during the course of the project. And uh, at the end of the project, donate or talk microscopes to local schools and make our spaces and labs that are in need of microscopes for research and educational purposes. So with our little project, we aim to train and educate as many Ghanaian uh, and African uh, students as possible on how revolutionary open science hardware can be for the African scientific community and also the alternative path to innovation that it offers uh, through the development of uh, low cost technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for that uh, comprehensive uh, presentation on the work that uh, Africa or is doing. Uh, I'd like to now invite the next presenter, who's Veronica from Proyecto Arfai. Uh, just also a reminder that there's translation. If you'd want to listen in, in English or Spanish, just click the button at the bottom. Veronica, over to you. Bueno, voy a dec decido hablar en español. Espero hablar lento para que se entienda bien. Eh, tengo unas diapositivas, las comparto, ¿verdad? Ok. Me dicen si se ven bien. Hicimos un pequeño guión para no pasarnos de tiempo. Eh, mi nombre es Verónica Yardes, participo en representación del equipo que conforma el proyecto que ven allí, Infraestructura para el Uso Responsable de Datos de Salud en la Argentina, Construcción de Capacidades y Comunidades en Torno a Datos Sensibles. El equipo está conformado por Mariela Renjewerk, como investigadora principal, Sabrina López, Laura Sion, Laura Alonso Aleman y yo, somos todas investigadoras de diferentes universidades y ámbitos de la ciencia, la tecnología y la innovación que ya trabajamos juntas en el marco de un proyecto anterior, que después les contaré un poquitito más, que es el proyecto ARFAI. Eh, los datos de salud, que son los que vamos a estar nosotros cuidando de alguna manera, tienen un ciclo potencialmente virtuoso, que va desde el acceso de la población al sistema de salud, momento en el que esos datos de usuarios y también los datos de la consulta son registrados por alguna gente, hasta su utilización, eventualmente, en una política de mejora que vuelve a la población, ¿verdad?, el registro de esos datos, que tiene limitaciones, que aprendimos mucho en nuestro propio proyecto, porque primero porque no llegan a la totalidad de la población, porque también están registrados de manera que no siempre es óptima, conforman esas bases de datos que pueden generar, después de una interpretación, por supuesto, información, conocimiento valioso también, si le damos un uso secundario. Nuestro proyecto se ubica en ese momento, en el del resguardo de los datos de salud para su reutilización, para generar valor a partir de ese reuso. O sea, fíjense que allí está remarcado. ¿no? La motivación para presentar este proyecto de, de, en IOI es resguardar el análisis de esos datos porque requiere de una infraestructura y seguridad adecuadas, ya que los datos de salud son datos sensibles, tienen información sensible 
de la ciudadanía. Son, es un caso específico de, de, de datos, ¿no? no son cualquier dato, son datos sensibles. Y este valor de los datos sensibles de salud se expresa o se puede realizar mejor en ese uso secundario, que es diferente, es secundario porque es diferente al uso original que se le dio, que es justamente brindar el servicio de atención a la salud. Entonces son utilizados, lo mencionábamos recién, por ejemplo, en, en políticas públicas que mejoren la gestión de la salud, también en brindar información pública, esto lo vimos mucho en pandemia, por supuesto, y para lo que nosotros usamos durante el proyecto ARFA, y también esperamos seguir haciéndolo gracias al apoyo de, de OI también, en investigación y desarrollo, en, es, en esa parte en particular como equipo de investigación. Y lo que está detrás, lo que subyace, digamos, como propósito de la presentación general de este proyecto en particular, es cómo trabajar de manera responsable y en comunidad, muy importante, con los datos sensibles de salud. Y esa experiencia previa que mencionaba en el proyecto ARFAI, a nosotros nos dio muchísimos aprendizajes y nos invitó también a construir bases para responder esta pregunta, y porque nuestro grupo de investigación de hecho surge a partir de ese proyecto ARFAI que tenía como objetivo aplicar ciencia de datos e inteligencia artificial en registros clínicos electrónicos para predecir brotes epidémicos. Es un proyecto que nace en el marco de la pandemia en el año en octubre del 2020 con financiamiento de la IDRC de, de Canadá y del SIDA de, de Suecia que fue finalizado en marzo de este año, no, del año pasado, ya estamos en 2024. Y ARFAI fue un proyecto testigo en lo que hace a ese uso responsable de datos de salud. Entonces, de hecho, además de todos esos módulos que ustedes ven allí, que no voy a desarrollar por un tema de tiempo, generó, aparece una línea emergente de investigación que es la de uso responsable de datos, que somos estas personas que están ahí, que somos parte del equipo actual de, de este proyecto de IOI en particular, donde trabajamos a los datos sensibles desde dos perspectivas. Uno como hacia el interior del proyecto, con lo que era la desidentificación, la, las condiciones de seguridad, la capacitación de las personas investigadoras involucradas, pero también trabajamos, producimos documentación que le sirvió a otras comunidades, especialmente el ámbito de la salud, pero buscamos también intervenir en ciertas políticas públicas como en la actualización de la ley de protección de datos personales en la Argentina. Entonces ese es en realidad nuestro, nuestro inicio de, de, de esta cruzada, que es sostener, en definitiva, este de hacer el, el gran objetivo de, de este proyecto en particular, sostener la infraestructura que usamos para el almacenamiento y procesamiento de los datos usados por ARFAI de una manera segura y así continuar las investigaciones y la construcción de comunidad alrededor, y de capacidades especialmente alrededor de, de esta propuesta. Y en ese sentido trabajamos en dos frentes, uno que es, por supuesto, la infraestructura, que implica sostener y mejorar la infraestructura que usamos durante los tres años del proyecto ARFAI, que nos brinda el Centro de Computación de Alto Desempeño de la FAMAF de la Universidad Nacional de Córdoba, que cabe decir que no solamente brinda la infraestructura, sino que entendió desde el inicio que las necesidades del equipo interdisciplinario de ARFAI no era solamente fierros, sino también un acompañamiento justamente a personas que no siempre habían estado trabajando dentro de ámbitos de seguridad adecuados, ¿no? sino que retiraban los, los datos y los trabajaban en otros lados, ese aprendizaje y ese, ese modelo lo, 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 lo mostramos también en otros ámbitos del mundo público, digamos. Eh, y por otro lado... Bueno, todo eso es lo que tiene que ver con la mejora de, de, de la prestación del servicio de infraestructura para que esos datos sigan estando disponibles en un lugar seguro. Y, y por otro lado, lo que tiene que ver con la construcción de comunidad con dos estrategias. Por un lado, la generación de documentación sobre el uso responsable de salud, sobre su gobernanza. Nosotros ya elaboramos algunos documentos y queremos elaborar algunos más. Y también cierta documentación necesaria para mantener la comunidad activa de ARFAI y, y más claramente organizada, que tiene que ver con el onboarding y el offboarding por el tipo de datos sensibles que utilizamos, y la segunda estrategia de la generación de comunidad está asociada a un proceso de, de, que esperamos hacer, que es de dictar capacitaciones tanto sobre el uso de datos sensibles de salud como capacitaciones al interior de nuestra propia comunidad para poder acceder en el caso de que corresponda a los datos eh, de salud de una manera segura. Todos los documentos generados, tanto tanto en, en las capacitaciones como en la documentación que mencionaba para la generación de la comunidad, por supuesto, van a estar abiertos. Lo mismo, la experiencia que podamos generar a partir de la ampliación de, de, la, de la infraestructura en, en el CECAD. Eh, antes de terminar, yo quería hacer una aclaración que tiene que ver con la coyuntura, que todavía no estaba tan clara cuando presentamos este proyecto, y es que, es un es una comentario a título personal desde la Argentina, que es que en nuestro país el cambio del gobierno nacional con el nuevo presidente Javier Minay, está poniendo en, en tela de juicio y está poniendo en riesgo en realidad 
la continuidad de muchos proyectos de investigación del financiamiento público a lo que tiene que ver con la ciencia y la tecnología, así que este slide de agradecimiento no solamente es por escucharnos estos cinco minutitos, sino por, por ofrecernos la posibilidad de buscar otros financiamientos mientras, mientras tratamos de, de resolver nuestros asuntos aquí adentro de, de nuestro país. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica, for that uh, presentation on responsible health, uh, uh, health data handling in Argentina. Uh, from Argentina, we go all the way to Uganda, uh, and I'd like to welcome uh, David Bukenya from the Consortium of Uganda University Libraries. Uh, David, over to you. I share, I share your slides? Yes, please. Okay. Slides for David. Yes. All right, good. Good evening, everyone. It's it's five it's uh, past five o'clock here in Uganda. And today just happens to be a, a, a liberation day, so it's been a holiday. So we're in for a long weekend over here in Uganda. Uh, but my my greetings uh, from this uh, warm country. Um, my name is David Bukenya, and I'm a librarian. Uh, basically with the uh, Uganda Christian University, but I do work with the consortium of Uganda University Libraries, and I'm I'm in charge of their uh, open access and open science uh, activities. Um, Open science in Uganda has a history of about, uh, let's say, a couple of years, but primarily we have been uh, working with um, with the electronic information for libraries, an organization uh, that deals with uh, several countries uh, in Europe and Asia and uh, South America and uh, Africa to support uh, libraries in terms of uh, particularly growth in their open access uh, activities. So we have worked with them for about 12 years, uh, particularly uh, building policies, uh, developing repositories, and ensuring that actually uh, we are getting Ugandan universities and research institutes to appreciate the value of open access. But of course, with the, with the move, with the coming of open science, We've had to grapple with this, and we've discovered um, that coming into this would require a lot more than we thought. And our repository, as they were, uh, are probably not adequate enough. And the many institutions that would like to come on board, but they don't have adequate infrastructure. So basically, this project here um, is coming in to ensure that actually we're improving the function of the repositories. Uh, that have been hitherto um, uh, functioning probably a little later than, than we would like to, because many have not uh, been upgraded to current uh, versions of what most of the universities use here in space. And so what this project will do is work on improving the function of these uh, repositories by upgrading them and also we'll be carrying out some installations of some new uh, basic repositories. But also uh, there is something here about uh, data management that has been some kind of white horse, so to speak. So we'll be also doing some data management in Uganda. Now this project will run for two years, uh, starting December uh, last year up to December 2025. In the first year we will do uh, what we've started doing already is some kind of assessment and planning uh, of the landscape of this, uh, the infrastructure and the status quo. And then we'll start upgrading, the, technically, basically, we'll start upgrading the repositories. Then we'll install some new ones. Then we'll go to this uh, hitherto data management training, which has been a bit of a white elephant here. 
but we hope we can actually get it uh, running. And also do some more advocacy and awareness of open science and youth management. In the second year, we'll be mostly doing a lot of uh, monitoring and evaluation of what has been done and just tightening the loose ends, ensuring that um, programs that will be set up uh, are working well, particularly the policies a lot would like to set up uh, and also building and sustainability activities that would ensure that this part is running uh, thereafter. Um, and of course, we have a cup. Uh, the outcomes that we would like to see is, of course, to see that um, we have a very clear understanding of the status quo of uh, the infrastructure uh, in terms of repositories and open access uh, technologies. And also upgrade, we're targeting about 17 repositories and five installations. Uh, but after the survey, we'll see how far that can be. And also improve the technical capacity of repository managers and uh, maybe IT personnel. And then also set up the data management. Uh, I thank you very much. And that's it from Uganda. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Thank you, let's, uh, moving on to the next presentation, just mm -hmm. one minute. Then we now are moving on to what? The framework for open and reproducible research training. Uh, and I'd welcome to the stage, uh, the fourth team. Would you want to share your screen or I do the sharing? Hello. Uh, yeah, I can I can share my screen. Uh, if you give me one second, can you see that? Okay. I can't see anybody, so I'm gonna need some kind of like uh, verbal feedback. I'm afraid. Is yes, working? we can see you. can see you. Perfect. Amazing. Um, so I'll just get started then. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, my name's Beth and Eileen. And I am talking today on behalf of the Framework for Open and Reproducible Research Training, also known as FORT. Um, our grant application was titled Improving the Accessibility and Usability of FORT's Open Educational Resources. Um, so very quickly, what does FORT actually do? Um, so there's been a lot of focus on open science in terms of the research process. Um, so things like data sharing, open access, sharing materials, pre-registration, all really, really important. Um, but it really does focus on researchers that are a bit more established, like they're doing the research. Um, people that are learning how to do research or even you know, undergraduates that are not even at that step yet, uh, they get a lot less attention. Um, and that means that teaching and mentoring of open science practices gets a little bit neglected. Um, and that's where we come in. Um, we want to try and help spread uh, awareness of education uh, for open science practices. So um, FORT is a volunteer based organization. Uh, we have a lot of people in our community um, and they are overwhelmingly volunteers. Uh, we uh, have got a bunch of awards and um, you know, we've provided all sorts of stuff. But to be honest, I think FORT as itself is a bit less important for this presentation. Um, I think the more important thing is our goals. Um, so we want to build a comprehensive framework so that um, like educators can uh, teach and mentor open and reproducible research in a way that works at, in a way that's like pedagogically informed. Um, we wanna equip, equip educators with high quality pedagogical tools and resources to help them teach that, those skills. We want to modify the academic incentive structure to recognize, reward, and elevate educators' roles. Uh, there's a lot of societies that have things like teaching awards, um, but we think that there needs to be a lot more focus and, and recognition because it takes a lot of time um, and it needs more, it needs more. Um, we hope to dismantle hierarchies surrounding teaching, research, and service. So um, for example, the hierarchies between high income economies versus low and middle income economies or uh, between um, you know, majority groups and marginalized groups within societies. Um, and then we also want to build an open scholarship community um, with our pool of wonderful volunteers, but also with other, other initiatives and organizations. Um, so linking into those goals, this is like a visualization of all of our open educational resources, and it would take 
it normally takes me 45 minutes to cover four of them. So <laughs> I'm not going to go into that today. Um, but um, there's information on our website um, about all of these resources. Um, and they're all open. They're all openly available. So you can go through them and use them as you see fit. Um, but speaking of the website, um, we want those resources to be easy to incorporate into people's teaching practices. We want them to be um, adaptable to all sorts of teaching scenarios. We want them to be dynamic so that you can use them um, in however works for you and whatever subject you're teaching. And we want them to be fair, so findable, accessible, interoperable and uh, reusable. Um, so we want people to actually be able to locate them on the website and then be able to use them no matter what their tech setup is. Um, however, our current website is absolutely loaded with these educational resources, but our website, just like everything else in Fort is maintained by volunteers. Um, updates to the website of kind of all over the place. They happen when people have got time um, and we really do not follow consistent uh, development practices or operations practices. Um, and the result is unfortunately a website, which although it's brilliant and it's it's got so much information on it, it's really not super easy to navigate. It can be a bit slow to load at times. It's not consistent with best practice guidelines such as web access accessibility guidelines. And it's also entirely in English. Um, there's not really many translation options either because a lot of things are in just PDFs that we've uploaded. So um, we would like to use our grant from IOI to improve the website's usability, accessibility, reliability, and clarity. Um, first of all, we want to redesign the website layout at the minute. Um, it's just like a drop down bar with all of the resources. And a lot of people load up our website, see the homepage, see the massive navigation bar, and just leave. Um, so we want to retain a few more visitors. Um, we want to convert our content to more accessible formats. Um, so for example, converting those PDFs into machine readable HTML so that they can actually be machine translated. Um, and also piloting audio visual formats for people that have different accessibility needs. We want to develop standardized policies and documentation for updating the fork code base and infrastructure so that we don't have those inconsistencies that we have. Um, and also reduce the average website loading time by um, kind of changing around our infrastructure. And we're also hoping to pilot an automated crediting process, which links individuals and the projects that they work on. Um, at the minute, there's kind of just like a text acknowledgement for every single person that has worked on a resource, um, but there's not really any central way for them to say, hey, go on this page on the Fort website and see all of the things that I've done. Um, so we wanna try and make that a bit more consistent because making sure people get credit for what they've done is so important for us. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a very quick summary. Um, here's the grant team. So there's me, Dominic Kirsch, uh, Helen Hartman, Letitia McKelly, and Flavio Azevedo. Um, and then there's also the massive uh, Fort community who always deserve a thank you because we wouldn't exist without their support. Um, and also thank you to IOI for giving us this opportunity. It really means a lot to us. Um, and if you want to find out more about Fort, um, our website is fort.org and you can drop us an email or find us on social media. Um, and I'm also personally happy to answer any questions. So yeah, uh, I hope that's helpful. <laughs> and yeah, let me know if you've got any questions. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Bethany, for that uh, succinct presentation. Uh, if there's any questions, perhaps we can share them on the on the Q and A. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to now invite uh, Fundacion Nutram. Uh, to give us uh, an overview of the work that they're doing. And I'd like to invite Jocelyn uh, to give us the presentation. Jocelyn, welcome. Do you want me to share slides or, or you go for it? Jocelyn. Hola, voy a partir yo, no sé si me, se escucha. Yes. Hola. Perfecto. Eh, hola a cada uno, buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Joana del Río, soy representante legal de la Fundación Nutram y vamos a hacer esta presentación junto con Jocelyn. Eh, nosotros somos una organización de la sociedad civil, estamos ubicadas en el sur de Chile. Eh, para quienes no conocen Chile, eh, somos un país largo y angosto eh, ubicado en Sudamérica, al lado de Argentina. 
son nuestros vecinos, y nosotros está, estamos muy honradas y orgullosas de poder compartir nuestro proyecto, porque es un proyecto creado desde la sociedad civil, y eso nos parece tremendamente relevante. Contarles que eh, somos una fundación que tiene más de 10 años de experiencia, que convivimos con la cultura mapuche. Nuestro país tiene 12 pueblos originarios, y de esos pueblos originarios, el que tiene mayor presencia en población es el pueblo mapuche. Y sin embargo, a pesar de que convivimos con esta cultura que tiene una tremenda influencia en nuestras vidas, en nuestra gastronomía, en nuestras formas de vida, en nuestras tradiciones, es un pueblo que está subvalorado y subrepresentado. Y específicamente eh, en torno a las mujeres es que nosotras hemos pensado este proyecto eh, pensando en que eh, este mundo femenino, el mundo de las mujeres, de la cultura mapuche, participa, tiene un 47% de participación en el mercado laboral, pero tiene ingresos inestables, precarios y, por supuesto, inferiores a los de los hombres. Eh, tiene un 50% más de pobreza por ingresos y presenta altas tasas de pobreza multidimensional respecto de las, de las mujeres chilenas. Entonces, como fundación estamos absolutamente comprometidos con aportar a la disminu disminución de las brechas de género y también con visibilizar el aporte de la cultura mapuche en nuestra sociedad. De hecho, nuestro nombre, Nutram, es una palabra en mapungún, que es la lengua de, de este pueblo mapuche con, con quienes nosotros convivimos. Eh, Jocelyn va a continuar con la presentación del, del proyecto. Sí, eh, de, um, mi nombre es Jocelyn Patterson um, y lo que nosotros vamos a trabajar en este proyecto es la creación de una comunidad y un repositorio abierto de mujeres mapuches para eh, de alguna manera unir dos mundos que usualmente están separados, que es el mundo académico de investigación y el mundo de las mujeres mapuches. Entonces, este proyecto involucra eh, implica visibilizar este rol de social, cultural de las mujeres mapuche eh, en toda la zona sur de, del país y además eh, identificar las investigaciones que se han generado en torno a las mujeres mapuche. Entonces, la siguiente presentación. Esto contempla la creación de un repositorio, como ya les decía, y también una comunidad en la cual se vea reflejada en los distintos roles, ya, ya sea en la soberanía alimentaria, eh, también en la defensa de derechos humanos. ¿ya? Muchas veces las mujeres tienen un rol de liderazgo importante en sus comunidades y por lo menos eh, y lo que queremos hacer es, es obviamente visibilizar su rol de liderazgo eh, también en la educación intercultural y eh, además de esto crear un repositorio como ya les mencionaba sobre eh, investigaciones enfocadas en ellas para eh, también reunir una comunidad de investigadores que está dispersa a lo largo de todo Chile. Chile es un país muy largo con muchas universidades entonces no hay una infraestructura eh, de repositorio fuerte en el país. Entonces, muchas investigaciones están dispersas, ocultas, en muchos repositorios, y eso es lo que nosotros queremos unir en esta, en esta herramienta. Así que vamos a visitar también comunidades mapuches para eh, recopilar ahí sus experiencias y también incorporarlas en este repositorio. Eh, para este trabajo contamos con un equipo de cinco personas actualmente, Queremos también eh, trabajar con voluntarios que nos puedan ayudar a recopilar esta información. Eh, tenemos, obviamente trabajamos con, con Joana, quien está acá presente, con Jorge, que nos apoya en la infraestructura, y también con una periodista que nos va a apoyar también en lo que es comunicación y también el trabajo comunitario. Y naturalmente acá eh, esto implica mucho trabajo, ¿no es cierto?, de, de expertise bibliotecaria, ¿no es cierto?, de, de, para recuperar esta, esta información. Y también lo que queremos hacer es eh, invitar a algunas universidades que tienen buenos repositorios con las cuales podemos intercambiar datos y hacer cosecha. Entonces, eso puede facilitar mucho el poblar este, repo este repositorio para, eh, digamos, que sea un poco más eficiente el proceso del poblamiento. Así que muchas gracias por su atención.
thank you thank you thank you uh Jocelyn and uh and uh yeah, yeah, uh i'd like to now hand over to um the lab team andres let me just share the slides in one minute Uh, B. Yes. Welcome. You you are sorry. You are sharing my screen. Your screen. Yes. No? Yes. Or oh, you want okay. to share yourself? If it's possible. I, uh... Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, and I apologize for that. Okay, thank you very much, all the UAE team for, for this. It's really a pleasure to be now starting this, this process together with all you this journey. And hi to everyone. My name is Andres Oliveira, also known as Oliver. I'm the manager of of LAVI, Latin America by Machine Network. And I'm going to talk about something about uh, our our network. We are building a collaborative network to advance bio machine in Latin America and how we are addressing the needs in terms of uh, training, education, and access to imaging technologies in Latin America and the Caribbean region. We are doing this, putting together not only imaging scientists, but also technology developers, uh, software, hardware, also industry representatives and policy makers and trying to coordinate all these pieces together to foster community and capacity building in the region. The idea is to create a unique voice and expand that voice into the region, and also to, to elevate this, that voice to integrate it to the, to the global and the international community. So Oliver, this... sorry, just a note, we can't see your slides yet. It seems to be stuck on loading. Ah, okay, sorry. That's all right. Now? I don't know. That's perfect. So maybe it's. As I said, we are building this, this network between these three pillars of building communities, capacity, and promoting the global integration. For that, we have a, a first a first grant that provides us the possibility to, to start running this network in 2022 and having these specific activities of centralized information, having a training program and career development program for the whole community, addressing needs and promoting integration with other partners, other networks yeah, in a global state, and organizing annual meetings to exchange experiences and uh, seeing how can face our challenges together. Some some numbers that I want to show now to see how it grows in, this, in these two years. We go from 82 members to 330 members. That means that there was really a, a need uh, on our community and we grow grow a lot uh, more than expected so that gives us for us a, a a big challenge in terms of how we structure this this network how we structure the governance uh, nowadays we have a steering committee that it's uh, composed by 12 members from seven countries and it's chaired by Andres Camay from Uruguay Lia Peter Santa from Argentina and Kilare Miranda from Brazil and this steering committee is it's driving our mission and vision, but we think that it's there is a, a, a need and it's a great example to start a community governance process. That is why we submit to this to this funding to, to implement this this community governance, promoting the openness, transparency, and also to engage our members to be in a, to create together this, this framework of governance in our community. We think that it's, it's extremely important 
for for our network for the successful network of our network and it's also a great example to to show to to other networks in the region and other networks globally on how to do this this process this funding will provide us the possibility to to cut on with the with the um, technical assistance some consultancy that can support us in this during this process and this process will start uh, already starts with the planning and assessment and looking for possible consultancies and we are going to elaborate a series of workshops uh, together with our community to brainstorm to show cases of of governance and see how can we build and which are our our needs and demands of our community to address and we are going to draft uh, governance policies that will be shown to our community in our annual meeting meeting at at the end of August and then communicate in several other meetings of other partner networks of course during the whole process will be a, a, a really strong communication dissemination that is also possible for for this grant to have an an, an assistant person that can uh, help to to the communication aspects uh, also for for this community i think it's extremely important to 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 open to this to this group of this funding anyone that can want to participate or has experience in this governance process that uh, it will be really helpful also for for us and if you want to know more about the about Labi or want to communicate, don't hesitate to, to contact me and follow us on any media. Thank you very much and apologize for the time. Thank you so much, uh, Andres. Uh, it seems like we are going to run just a little bit over time. Uh, I'd just kindly ask that maybe if we can be able to stay on for the next maybe like 10, maximum 15 minutes so that we can finalize with the last two presentations. And I'd like now to introduce uh, Batul uh, from uh, Open Science Community Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you see my screen? Uh, okay. Um, yes, so thank you. So, okay. Uh, so thank you so much. We're very very excited to be part of this scheme, uh, along with this wonderful project. I'm gonna try to speak a bit slowly just to help the translator. But if I'm over the time, just give me a shout. Uh, I'll yeah, I'll, I'll make sure that I look at the chat. Uh, I'll be talking about our project around creating this platform for capacity building for Arab speaking country. This is a project that was initiated around early 2023 uh, by a wonderful team. Um, Lamise Ricci and Sandy, both Lamise Ricci actually both in today's call and this team are the one who done all the work. I'm just doing all the talking here. Um, so I'll be giving very, very brief about who we are, what we do, like motivation with this work. Um, just for background about our community, which was incubated initially by the Open Life Science. And as part of this international network, uh, we share the same vision, but one of our mission is to support the growth of similar sort of initiatives within the Arab region. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're trying to leverage the communities around the world and really connect them with the open science advocate within the Arab region. So connect people together, or convene together. We're trying to focus in aspects or principles within open science where there is a lack of resources in, in Arab speaking countries. Uh, most of what we know within Arab countries about open access. So we try to look into other sort of aspects like open source verification, open license, localization, and we focus a lot in capacity building and, and building or creating these open education resources. Uh, and we do capacity building through different means, including paid internship, co-leading event talks, feeding into the UNESCO working group for capacity building, nomination for schemes or championship by other sort of community or institutions. And probably the one that most relevant to the project here is that we give uh, live workshops for institutions and researchers to acquire skills and tools and make the research more open or reproducible. And this is mostly run by volunteers, instructors, uh, in courses that run for days and weeks. Uh, however, the limited sort of resources or limited power made it really difficult to scale and do more of these sort of workshops. And that's what prompted or motivated the development of the open innovation platform. 
as both the front end back end has been completed back in early 2023 by wonderful Rishi and Sandy and the clients by Lamise. But the platform, <clears throat> sorry, the platform itself meant to help really to scale our work and empower these Arabic speaking individuals with a cost of free uh, training, uh, targeting researchers, academic educators, uh, and scientific institutions. Uh, so this is just how the platform looked like in English and in Arabic. Um, so it's bilingual. And we've also made extensive sort of documentation um, for transparency. Um, I'm not going to go through. So we use sort of open source technology, open licensing. Uh, we have, uh, again, documentation. I'm not going to go through the nitty gritty. But essentially what we're trying to do is, um, again, not to recreate the wheels. We want to extend on what's already been built by the community and curate resources and, rather than create them. So, And most importantly, really, to liberate them to the need of the, of the Arab researchers within the region and localize them. Uh, reflect that in the documentation, collect feedback in sort of agile process. And this feedback will be collected mostly from our member, but also from different sort of partners that we have and network within the Arab regions and institutions. Um, this will bring me to the very end. Uh, again, I'm very, very excited to have this support from the IOI and yeah, and can't wait to develop this work further. Uh, stop sharing. Thank you so much, uh, Batu. Uh, and now last but not least, I'd like to invite the Open Environmental Data Project. Uh, perhaps if uh, we have a representative, a representative that would want to give us an overview of the program. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you so much again to IOI for the support. And it was just really wonderful listening to all the other grantees projects. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to see how things develop for all of us. Um, I don't have slides, so hopefully things will go fast and I also have a terrible cold. So, you know, don't want to subject uh, you for too long to this uh, nasal voice. Um, the title of my project is From Data Justice to Climate Justice, Modeling and Open Collaborative Review Process. Um, just a little bit of a backstory as to how this project um, originated. So around October, 2021, I was a part of the engine rooms mapping um, exercise, the landscape analysis was, uh, so the engine room, if you're not familiar with their work, they're a social justice and tech advocacy organization. And uh, they work with communities all over the world and you know support them in using tech and data tools um, you know, in their social justice uh, work. And I was a part of that project where we were looking at how climate justice and environmental justice spaces and actors were working with digital rights folks and you know what the overlaps were, what the gaps were. And the report that came out of that project, you know, was very well received, but my lead author and I was the consultant researcher on that project, we you know realized that there's actually a lot more in this intersectional space you know there's a lot of activity going on a lot of energy and we wanted to kind of build this out into a more um longer piece of work and that you know led us to write a book proposal and you know we signed a book contract with um sage publications summer of last year and um the thing that you know we quickly realized was that one lot of work like this it you know really comes out of the practice of activists of community advocates but a lot of that just gets lost in the traditional academic peer review process right and we really wanted to create an open peer review platform where everyone we'd interviewed everyone we had chatted with everyone who had you know in some way or another influenced us and mentored us in this uh, project would get a chance to kind of speak back uh, to the work as it was developing. And so, you know, what we have proposed is an open collaborative review process. And the idea is that the pilot 
um, can be used or remixed or ported into, you know, any other similar writing initiative where it's not just, you know, a bunch of researchers or scholars, but also practitioners, activists, community folks who can all be a part of um, the review and writing process. And so, you know, this is a really exciting opportunity for me because I'm a social scientist by training and, you know, anything open, open science, that's just something that has not quite um, emerged or broken into, uh, you know, the humanities and social sciences as much as we'd like. And so we are kind of excited to see what we can do by bringing an open review ethos um, into a set of disciplines that, you know, doesn't ordinarily engage with these principles. So, yeah, we're really excited to launch the open infrastructure. The main kind of platform will be on PubPub and we'll be inviting our reviewers and commentators and collaborators to engage with us on that platform as the drafts of the different chapters uh, become available. So thank you again to IOI and thank you all for staying on uh, these extra few minutes to hear me and Patu talk about our projects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maduri, for that uh, uh, lovely presentation. Uh, so it seems like we are now at, at the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you so much to all of the, the projects that are presented. And in terms of the next steps, what's going to happen is we are going to be looking at giving periodic updates as the organizations continue to implement the presentations that they have just uh, shared with us. We hope that this session has been inspirational for you. And if that has been the case on the shared notes document, there's contacts if you can either want to reach out directly to these uh, projects to kind of see areas of collaboration or support them in any way possible, uh, kindly reach out. Or also, you can also be able to reach out to us as IOI and we can be able to facilitate that connection. But uh, I, I think this has been a great presentation and I just would want to wish you all a lovely weekend and see you next time. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and see you. Thank you. Thank you.